partnership with Professor Azioni at least Arena Civil Dialogues, this program is an opportunity for us to have community conversation about very important topics and subject matters that are interlinked, very much impacting us today. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we've been doing some, this now for uh, more than a year and a half, and it's been a wonderful joint project uh, uh, with Arena Stage, and uh, the fact that we keep having people coming back, uh, we find very reassuring. Uh, our purpose was and is to show that people of different backgrounds and different opinions can have a civil uh, dialogue. So far, we have been successful. Just to be sure, though, and I mentioned it before, this is the theater, so there are trap doors below the chairs, and when, if things don't get civil, they... Now, uh, in preparing myself for uh, tonight, I asked uh, several uh, uh, fellow citizens right down the corridor and in the supermarket uh, what does the term democracy uh, bring to mind? And uh, I got again and again the same response. Well, of course, it's the rule of the majority and somebody who still remembered their civic class from high school elaborated and said, you know, in the olden days, the king or the, uh, was the sovereign, but now uh, the people are the sovereign and how do you know what the the people position is, we, the vote or, and the majority get it say on the assumption some other day, the other part of the community will have the majority. And that made me uh, think I should remind us that none of you will want to live in that kind of democracy because the democracy we cherish is really a hybrid between one part, the rule of the majority, but then there's a long list of things like our right to free speech, to uh, petition, to pray, uh, our individual rights, which are not subject to majority rule. And so I like the term constitutional democracy. Some people talk about the liberal democracy. Some people talk about it's a republic. But the main thing to remember is that uh, it, we combine the high respect for individual minority rights with the role of the majority. The reason that is not simply a nice academic exercise and bring you back to your college days is there are people run around, uh, and some of them quite influential, who came up with the term el electoral democracy. And so the moment they see some country has an election, they plant a little flag, say, hey, this is a democratic country. Well, it ain't necessarily so. If they don't have a constitution, and if they don't have a constitution which is heated, uh, we have, at best, a very flawed democracy. I'm just going to make one more point, and then I'm anxious to listen to uh, my colleagues. So now, if we talk about this republic or constitutional democracy, there's a rather different narratives. How easy it is to get that kind of regime and how easy it is to sustain it. And I'll just use two extreme bookends, and there's room for all kind of positions in between. So on the one hand, we had this notion that people naturally take to democracy. After all, that is the preferred regime. That's liberty. That's rights. And people take to it like a sunflower to the sun. Just give them half a chance, uh, remove the authoritarian regulations, and they will take uh, to, to form democratic regimes. That's why in uh, 1990, so several fairly uh, influential people thought that the people in the Soviet Union, within two years, were going to have a flourishing democracy and capitalism. All you had to scrape is all those burdens we put on them but the totalitarian government, why? Of course they're going to go for a liberal democracy. And that was one of the reasons uh, the group called Volkan, President Bush, particularly Wolfowicz, thought that when, if we invade Iraq, we're going to be created with 
uh, people putting flower petals in our paths and spend 1.7 billion and we're going to have not only a flourishing democracy in Iraq, but it's going to be such a wonderful model that all the Middle East is going to flip and say, look what they have in Iraq. We all want that. And of course, most influential is Francis Fukuyama, can be said here, of the end of history. What does what it mean, the end of history? Because once people came to democracy, Fukuyama thought, they will not want anything else. So once all country will reach the state of democracy, history will be ended, I mean, in a sense, of political uh, development. Well, it turns out it's not so easy. And so I, I, I would suggest to go to the opposite extreme of this continuum, that democracy is a very delicate plant. It goes only where the soil is carefully cultivated and prepared. And it needs continuous nurture and tending which to survive. And so that's why I think if you look what happened in Afghanistan and Iraq, where we spent, we can argue, half a trillion, three quarter of a trillion dollars to try to make them into democracies, uh, we're very, very far. That's why we've been so disappointed in the Arab Springs, which were, the uprising were not followed as a rule with new uh, uh, dem democracies. And let me close here with the following. Uh, people who are on the optimistic side of this continuum often point to Japan and Germany as two examples where we came, uh, United States, helped these countries and turned them from authoritarian regime to thriving democracies. But if you did, as I did and my colleagues did, and look at the conditions which exist in these two countries, you find that none of them exist in the Middle East or many other places. First of all, there was complete cessation of hostilities. There were no terrorists, no guerrillas, no, no infighting when they started on the democratic project. There was already a very strong sense of national unity. There was a very high level of education, a very sizable middle class, and a strong industrial base. All conditions which are very helpful for the democratic development but are not available in many of the places. We're planting our little flags and saying, hey, we just made a democracy here. So uh, I'm, my colleagues and I agreed to start the discussion in two rounds. In the first round, we're going to ask, is there a democratic crisis? Is there a democratic recession? And what causes it? And then we're going to ask, uh, what can we do to amend and nurture that very delicate uh, plant. Uh, we're not going to introduce the speakers. You have details of information uh, in your brochure. Norm, please take it from here. Uh, thank you, Amitai, uh, and thank you for all that you have done over uh, 90 years uh, to uh, uh, focus on important problems facing this society and others, and thanks to Arena Stage. And I want to thank all of you and commend you for your courage to be so intrepid to come out in the middle of a national emergency and <laughs> risk your lives to come down to southwest uh, Washington. And I want to urge you all to do what now is clear is our patriotic duty. Go out and play golf uh, at least a couple of times to show those people streaming in over the borders that we're not going to take it anymore. Uh, so with that, uh, the answer to your question, Amitai, that I would give is I'm very worried. I'm worried not just about the United States, but the state of the world. Uh, I'm worried in part because uh, this is the first experience that we've had in this country of having a narcissistic sociopath as the President of the United States. Uh, it starts with that, but it doesn't end with that, and it didn't start with him being elected to office. The roots of this go back much deeper. But uh, just to pick a few examples, we now have this cottage industry of books on how democracies die and how autocracies emerge and thrive. And they're rooted in history and they're looking in a comparative way. And uh, if you go not very many blocks from here to the Holocaust Museum, there's a, an exhibit of the steps that led to fascism. 
and it's a checklist and it's really disturbing to go down that checklist. It starts with attacks on the freedom of the press. Today, our president tweeted out yet again uh, that the lying, uh, fake news media are the enemy of the people. And I would simply remind you all, or tell you if you don't know, that that phrase was used by Stalin to justify murdering millions of people and repression. And Khrushchev, when he became the head of the Soviet Union, banned the use of the phrase enemy of the people because it's too dangerous. So there is something very disturbing about that. And when we have a Washington Post journalist brutally murdered and by uh, what seems on the surface to be the order of uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia and the administration won't even release a report to Congress of the facts behind it, it tells you even more about what's happened with the press. And if you watched his interchanges with the press uh, when he announced the state of emergency, that's troubling. Uh, there's that. The second is attacks on the independence of the judiciary, which goes along with attempts to subvert the judiciary and make them responsive to your interests and not to the larger rule of law. And we could spend a lot of time talking about how that's happening. It almost always includes a cult of personality. And uh, only I can fix it, uh, and I'm going to do this, all of those things. We could go down through many more, and I think there are dangers. Now, those dangers were apparent to our framers when they set up the Constitution. You do not have to see, although I would recommend seeing Hamilton uh, by Lin-Manuel Miranda, uh, to know that he wrote a lot about this, and we built in checks and balances. What if those checks and balances don't work? And we see many signs that a Republican Congress simply has not done any of the things through hearings, investigations, oversight, uh, rallying behind things that should not be rallied behind. Uh, and with control over still one House of Congress, that's a danger. And the judiciary, I'm not sure we can count at this point on the Supreme Court. We were talking about this earlier, and I'm sure we'll come back to it. We have an example, of course, in the Youngstown Steel decision where the Supreme Court slap down Harry Truman when he sees the steel mills with a real crisis, uh, or at least a real uh, a, a bad situation with the Korean War. But then we have the Korematsu decision uh, where the court let Franklin Roosevelt round up and d put in terrible conditions a very large number of American citizens uh, during the Second World War. So I'm not sure about that. Now, that's a place to start we could do a tour of the world and see that some of the conditions, immigration here is not the big problem, but it is in a lot of other countries where it's creating stresses and changing the fabric of uh, social democracy, even in countries where we would have celebrated it over and over again, like the Netherlands and Sweden and places like that, but it's obviously changed the dynamic in Italy and helped to give us uh, a government that is uh, not far different at this point, somewhat different, but not far down the path towards something like what Mussolini gave us. Uh, we know that there uh, is a populist move around the world as the global economy has created uh, uncertainties for people and a sense with yawning economic inequality everywhere that the institutions aren't working and the elites aren't doing it, and that's leading to things like Brexit and to the possibility that Britain could end up with a left-wing uh, prime minister who's uh, an anti-Semite and has many other very bad qualities. Who knows what will happen in Germany when Merkel leaves. Uh, and uh, we have France now in serious uh, question as Macron's standing has declined dramatically. And we can look in our own hemisphere at Venezuela at what's happening in uh, Brazil. Uh, it's on the left, it's on the right, but it's a move away from the fundamental values of democracy. Uh, it, uh, as I started, it didn't start with Donald Trump. Uh, some of the conditions are political tribalism, the yawning economic inequality, the populism that emerged in the aftermath of uh, the financial crisis uh, in two, uh, the fall of 2008. Uh, the challenges that we have with structures of government that don't meet the 21st century. One of the, I'll just end with a figure that I use all the time now. 
By 2040, 70% of Americans will live in 15 states. People are moving where jobs are. Within our states, there's an enormous divide between the uh, thriving metropolitan areas and as you move out to small towns in the rural areas. But after 2040, 30% of Americans are going to elect 70 of the 100 senators. The Electoral College is tilting away from a situation where we can be confident that Americans will choose a president. And the more that happens, the more there's a sense of illegitimacy. If there is a sense that the government is not representing people, it doesn't have to be a pure democracy, we're a republic. But in the republic, voters elect representatives who then are supposed to represent them. What if they don't represent them anymore? Some of these challenges are going to exist and persist long after Donald Trump is gone. And in other countries, the damage may be deeper a little bit further down the road, including our those in our alliances, or what used to be our alliances. So have a nice day. Um, well, democracies tend to run into difficulty when people are afraid. And they're usually afraid for one of two reasons. They're afraid because of economic strains, uh, or they're afraid because of war or the threat of war. Uh, and when this occurs, you see uh, democratic recessions or democratic rescissions. Um, uh, in the United States history, you've seen periods where civil liberties were uh, abused, where constitutional uh, limitations were overridden. Um, going back to, into the 18th century, the Alien and Sedition Acts, um, in the run-up to the War of 1812, where people were jailed simply for criticizing the administration's foreign policy. Um, uh, you have the Civil War, where uh, Lincoln <coughs> suppressed habeas corpus. Um, you have uh, World War I and the immediate aftermath, the Red Scare, where again, um, there was severe repression of people who disagreed with the government. Um, and then you had, of course, uh, as Norm has already mentioned, the decision to uh, essentially incarcerate um, uh, tens of thousands of Japanese American citizens during the Second World War. And then you had McCarthy. Um, uh, the, uh, and this is tr this is a phenomenon, again, uh, is uh, evident abroad. Um, the, the first major rescission uh, in democracy was after the Great Depression. And so you had Italy, you had Germany, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and other countries that were uh, emerging democracies, not consolidated democracies at the time, that went under. Um, and you had significant challenges to democracies in the United States, um, which was overcome with the New Deal and, and, and with an American aversion to some of those more extreme solutions that were perpet perpetrated at the time. Um, so today we're seeing the same phenomenon, um, uh, much as uh, happened after the Great Depression. You've seen a milder form of it after the Great Recession. You've seen it in the United States. You've seen it in Western Europe or in Europe as a whole. Um, uh, uh, and again, it tends to be the weaker democracies, the less consolidated democracies, the newer democracies that suffer most. That uh, uh, in which the institutions are less formal, le less strongly developed, um, uh, and so in, in in Europe you have Hungary, you have Poland, um, you have some of the other newer democracies in Eastern Europe um, that are um, having difficulty sustaining the reforms they put in place after the end of the Cold War, um, and the number of demo the number of countries in the world that are rated as free by Freedom House, for instance, that rates every country in the world every year, has gone down. Now, that doesn't mean the number of people in the world living under democracies have gone down, because mostly these are small countries, and the big countries like India, the United States, uh, Indonesia, um, most of the Western Europe, they uh, are not uh, suffering to the same degree. They're under pressure, as, a, as is our democracy. But, um, but they're, they're healthier, they're more resilient. Um, and so actually the number of people living under fully free governments hasn't gone down, although the number of countries that are no longer fully free 
has gone down. Nevertheless, it's still a startlingly large number. In the 18th century, there's only one in the United States. In the 19th century, you had France and Germany and a few other Western European countries, and that was it. Um, then in the, uh, the post-World uh, post War II world, during the Cold War, there was a gradual expansion of democracy to all of Western Europe um, and, and uh, weaker democracies in Latin America uh, and some places in Asia. And then after the Cold War, you had another major expansion of democracies, um, uh, which brought us up to a period where, th uh, where two-thirds to three-quarters of the world were functioning democratic systems. And so there's been some recession uh, for the reasons that I've, uh, that I've cited. Um, uh, we faced uh, challenges like this in the past, and we've overcome them. Uh, we, have, we, we haven't overcome them easily. We haven't come, overcome them without effort. We haven't overcome them without risk, but we have overcome them. And so have other democracies, and the number of democracies has, over time, continued to rise. There's been a slight diminution, but I think it's too early to th throw in the towel and decide that, uh, that this is a long-term trend and that we're going to see an erosion of democracy in this country or in the world as a whole uh, uh, sustain itself over the next several decades. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> first of all, Amitai, thank you for the invitation. Let me see if I can provide a little additional perspective on the, the picture that... Uh, my two colleagues have put forward. We started this century with a tremendous amount of hope for democracy in the world. We came into this century with a lot of momentum out of the last 20 or 30 years of the last century. But here we are almost 20 years into this century and the talk is gloomy and the talk is of democratic recession. What happened? <clears throat> what happened to that optimism and why did we end up where we are? I think what's important is that it's hard not to feel this gloom is just sort of like one big dark ball, you know, eating at us, and it all feels interconnected. And it, there are some connections among some different things, but I'd like to suggest to you there are really three different trends that have brought us to this point, and they're, they're different parts of the world being affected in different ways. The first trend is that in the last quarter of the last century, almost 100 countries moved away from authoritarianism and attempted to move towards democracy in Latin America, in Africa, and parts of the Middle East, lots of parts of Asia, Eastern Europe, and so forth. In that group of countries, very few of that, those countries, as Amitai suggested, had sort of the established rule of law, strong institutions, a tradition of pluralism, and other basic features that would help facilitate such transitions. And what's happened in the last 20 years is a lot of those transitions have really shown strain under the problems of those kind of conditions. So Brazil, for example, a country about which, you know, we had a lot of hope and seemed to be doing very well, fell in the last five years into a terrible economic crisis and a crisis of confidence by the public and the politicians not to be systematically corrupt. And so they chose, you know, they made a sort of a, a blind and, and problematic choice for somebody who promised to clean up the system. Or South Africa, a country that 26 years ago in 1993 was so hopeful. I mean, was there a country in the, in the world that seemed more hopeful as a moving forward in democracy, but fell into, again, systemic corruption on the part of the ruling party, which has led to a lot of public anger and political churning and other things. So first we have a set of countries that have been trying to become democratic, but have really been struggling. Second. We have another set of countries in North America and Europe and a few other parts of the world like Asia with Australia and parts of East Asia that were established democracies that we thought you could count on. You know, there was the feeling that once you reached a certain level of consolidation of democracy, that's it, you're there, you're fine. You're bulletproof in a sense democratically. That proved not to be the case and we'll probably talk more about, and I can't think of anyone better than, than Norm to, to tell us more about why the U.S. has struggled so much. But a couple of things have hit the established democracies. One is 20 years, particularly in Europe, but in other parts of established democracies of slow economic growth, building public frustration, economic dislocation, 
as middle class wages have stagnated or declined in the West and risen in Asia. And then a big economic crisis in 2008 and 9, which drove inequality and hit people's living standards. So first you have economic, economic anger and frustration. Second, you had a lot of social change occur in these countries. You look back over the last 20 years, uh, throughout <coughs> the established democracies, you have a lot of social change. People have gotten used to gay marriage. People have gotten used to a changing role for women. People have gotten used to a lot of immigration. But it turns out, as we've been learning in the last few years, not everybody got used to that. Some people don't feel comfortable with that. And they are angry at the society or at the system. And again, they're making political choices out of frustration and anger that are destructive to the systems because of their anger. So the established democracies, to our surprise, because of these economic drivers and these social drivers, have also proven to be under strain and under stress. Then there's a third group of countries, which are the authoritarian countries. 20 years ago, we thought authoritarianism was yesterday's toast, fading into the, the ashes of history, had no future. And we thought that the two big authoritarian countries of today, China and Russia, would move in a positive direction. China would grow and grow itself out of authoritarianism into democracy. Russia would move down a pro-Western kind of path politically and socially. Neither of those things has occurred. And to our surprise, authoritarians have thrived in certain ways, survived, and they're much more assertive today than they were 20 years ago. So we face a world not just that we're stumbling, but people who have a different political system are actually feeling self-confident in some ways and strutting on the world stage. So you put those three trends together. The new democracies showing strain because of the weakness of the institutions and practices. The established democracies that are stumbling and under stress for their own reasons. And then the authoritarians feeling pretty self-confident. That's the gloomy democratic picture that we have today. And that's why it all feels like one big thing, but it's different things. I'll just finish by saying there are one or two things that do join this. One is that the new technologies that we have for communicating and sharing information turn out to be tougher on democracy than we thought. We all know it now. It seems obvious, but it didn't five years ago even or 10 years ago that new communications technologies make it easier for populist politicians to speak directly to people and step over the traditional gatekeepers and the standard bearers and step over directly and put out uh, disinformation on a daily basis that they need to and, and reach people. New communications technologies and information have led to a lot of manipulation of information. We're faced with false information every day when we open our phone or turn on our computer or look at an iPad. There's all kinds of disinformation that's now in front of you and it's hard to know what's what. It's allowed communities to fragment and people to live in their own information bubbles and so forth. And so the new communications and information technologies which are shared among all three of these groups of countries is one common condition that's proving to be, a, unfortunately, a, a unifier of, of democratic stress. But the one thing I want to just add a bit of note of cheer to what started as a gloomy start to our conversation. One of the biggest trends of the last several, last five, seven years is protests. Open the newspaper and day after day these days and you will see protests bursting out country after country. And some of my colleagues at the Carnegie Endowment and I have been charting uh, protests over the last five to seven years, and there's a steady increase in angry citizens bursting out against their power holders looking for change. In Guatemala, they didn't like the corruption. In South Korea, they threw out the president. In Romania, they're protesting over corruption. Um, you could go around the world. Sudan, just a couple of weeks ago, big new protests. Iran, last year at this time. Citizens don't want to take it anymore. Citizens have higher expectations. Citizens are angry and they're trying to express their anger into something productive. This is a good thing. It's good that people aren't taking it sitting down. That in a way is a, is a good impulse. Now it's hard for power holders to respond productively, but this isn't an age in which the individual has gone to sleep, in which the political imagination has died. People want something better and they're pushing for it. So it's an age of democratic distress but it's also an age of citizen empowerment and citizen demand. Well, that's an excellent, excellent beginning. I think the surprising unanimity about uh, there is room for a very serious uh, concern. Let me just add one line to your last comment, but I think it's very true that the citizens are not taking it anymore. It's not at all clear to me 
that uh, while they're very good at challenging existing regimes, that they are equally good at forming new positive ones. So often when you see what you saw in Egypt, they're very good at toppling the old regime, but when it comes then to formulating a new one, I, I haven't seen as many uh, signs. Be before we go to part two about what can we do about it, I just, if you each would maybe take a minute and talk about one specific cause, which uh, I'm having di I don't think we discussed, and that's the, the tension between globalism and nationalism. Uh, so let me put it slightly provocatively. Uh, is it fair to say that one of the reasons, there are many, that democracy is so challenged is that the liberal elites are out of step with the major part of the people are. That uh, they are uh, willing to embrace free trade without paying enough attention to the pain inflicts on some part of the population, that they are uh, willing to embrace uh, immigration more than the people want. I'm all in favor of immigration, I'm an immigrant. But uh, uh, the question is, are they out of step? Have they brought along uh, uh, the people with, to their uh, 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 policies? So uh, are they elite globalistic? Well, the people are nationalistic, and is that part of the problem? A brief round, please. Well, I, I can start by saying certainly you're right that there's a tension there. And just looking at the United States, I would say, I'm not sure I would frame it as globalism versus nationalism. I think the reaction against elites and the way they've dealt with the uh, rapid changes that have occurred in uh, social divisions and in uh, the economies have given an opening to leaders who can play on nationalism and it's not just nationalism. When Donald Trump says, make America great again, and he calls that nationalistic, it's also playing into some other elements that have been there long before we had this kind of globalism. And that's racism, uh, plain and simple. Uh, and it's hearkening back to a time when people who now think they're not on top of the world, even if they weren't doing great economically, they, were, they could go wherever they wanted. And others uh, are now usurping their position. So there's that. On the globalism front, I would say there are a couple of, uh, of elements here. Um, one, certainly, and this is a part of Donald Trump's appeal, when he went to people and said, I'm speaking to you and I care about you, even though the policies have been uh, terribly detrimental to them, there was a sense that he was the first one who was addressing them with respect that they had fallen behind. And some of that is the urban-rural division that we have now and the, the sense in a global economy that if you have education and if you have an infrastructure around you, which the urban centers have, you can thrive and you can adapt to all of those changes that are taking place. And in other areas where they're not thriving and adapting, there is this larger sense that the people who are doing well just don't give a shit about them. And so somebody who speaks up for them, that can make a difference. But the other part of it that I think is a really important one, and this is true globally, but it's particularly true here, is the degree to which economic inequality has grown and the one-tenth of one percent have grown more arrogant, more combative, but also view themselves as victims. And I say this at least once a week. To me, emblematic of it was Steve Schwartzman, the multi-billionaire uh, hedge fund guy who, when Barack Obama said, maybe we should think about changing the tax rate for carried interest, likened it to Hitler invading Poland. And now I see new data that shows that the one-tenth of one percent in the world have more wealth now than the bottom 60 or 70 percent of the rest of the world more than billions of people. And as that gets accumulated and they live high lives that are very visible, the resentment that others are gonna feel grows and that is just fertile ground for people who can play on nationalism, racism, and other vile things and lead us to uh, a decline of civil society. I think there's three aspects of globalism that have become controversial. First is trade. Second is immigration. Third is the internet, which Tom's already talked about. Um, it's, uh, globalism means free or freer movement of goods, people, and ideas. And all of those 
create problems. Now, in terms of trade, there's the feeling that cheap foreign labor um, undercuts American labor and depresses um, uh, and depresses the job market. I think most economists believe that it's really more automation um, and other technological change rather than cheap foreign labor, which is displacing a lot of traditional American workers. But uh, but but uh, trade is a is an easy target. Uh, immigration. Um, illegal immigration is at historic low, so so much for the national emergency. But uh, but but the number of Americans, number of people in this country who weren't born in this country, is at a historic high. So there's more foreign-born people in this country than ever before. So the, if there's a problem with immigration, it's legal immigration, because most of the foreign-born people here are legal. And the problem is, as Tom has indicated, that some people are uncomfortable with the changes that immigration brings in terms of culture and ways of doing things. Um, they could be wrong. I think most people who live in large metropolitan areas like Washington and New York and say, where most of the immigrants come are quite comfortable with immigration and see the value. And the people who are uncomfortable with it are the ones who see the fewest number of immigrants. But uh, nevertheless, it is a challenge culturally and, and, a, and, a, and, and one of the areas of globalization that's controversial. And you've already talked about the, the, uh, the, the, the information uh, revolution and the fact that nobody, that, that it's difficult to pin responsibility for irresponsible uh, information in, in, in the current uh, media environment. So those are the sources of, uh, of, um, of globalization that create friction. Now, on the other hand, globalization has created the most peaceful and prosperous world we've ever had. Um, the, uh, uh, this is the best world that humanity has ever experienced. There are fewer people as a proportion of the world population that are in poverty than ever before in history. There's a larger middle class than ever before in history. There hasn't been a single war among major powers since 1945. There, hasn't, there have been very few wars between countries since 1945, historically, dramatically low. There have been lots of civil wars, um, and, uh, uh, but even those are actually down from what they were 30 years ago. Um, they dominate the news, but they're a relatively small proportion of what's going on in the world. So we are uh, in the best of all worlds, or at least not, not the best of all possible worlds, but the best of all actual worlds. And it's, and it's for the exact same reason that it's created all of these tensions that we've talked about. Now, uh, I think Americans, uh, you know, we, we, tend to, we tend to not only compare our situation to what it used to be, we compare it to what others are. And so there's a feeling that China is catching up and it is catching up. It's growing faster than the United States. And that's because it was a developed country. It made some wise economic choices. And developed countries can naturally grow faster than developing countries, underdeveloped countries, that is, can grow faster than developed ones because they can harness existing technologies to grow. And so China is growing faster and it is catching up. Um, and so are a number of other countries in the world. That doesn't mean we're falling behind. We've advanced more slowly. Um, and so there's a perception that, uh, that, that we're losing our position in the world as a result. And that's another one of the reasons for, uh, I think, the dissatisfaction. And Norm has talked about income disparities, which I think is, a, is another major factor underlying the sense of grievance and, uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, and the uh, friction and, uh, and challenges to democracy not only in the United States, but in other developed countries where a similar phenomenon has developed. I know you want to move on, so I'll be really brief on this one, Amitai. The charge that the liberal elites are out of touch is, it's a distortion that uh, 
certain politicians use, let's just take one example, immigration, to say that liberal elites favor immigration and the heartland, whatever that is, doesn't, that's just false. Actually, a majority of Americans like immigration, have been comfortable with it, are proud of it, and know what it's done for our country. It's actually a relatively small group of people. I don't know how you would describe them. They're not liberal elites, they're something else. A small group of people who are really angry about it and who can be stirred up about it and so forth. And for them to say the other 70% of the country are, quote, liberal elites, it's just name calling. It's not a serious argument. Emmett, I just, uh, one thing we shouldn't forget about here uh, goes beyond globalization. Climate change is itself responsible for a lot of the political instability and pushback against democracy. If you think about what's happened in Northern Africa, where you had thriving societies, there were small farmers, you actually had economies that worked. And climate change has brought these droughts that have basically devastated the economies, they've devastated the societies, They've led to the rise of extremist movements. They've driven people out, and they have uh, moved, of course, many tragically out in the seas, drowning. They've gone to Italy. They've gone into Europe. And that has contributed to uh, some of the other political changes that have taken place. So there, you know, climate change goes beyond the questions of uh, disruptions in our lives that may come because the seas are rising itself it's having a big impact on the political challenges we face around the world, not just uh, the things that have happened with globalization. Well, uh, so now to the easy part of the evening, <laughs> in, in which you're gonna tell us how we're gonna fix all this. And uh, it would be helpful as we discuss it, if you don't mind making a distinction, what can the United States do overseas and what we have to do in our, put our own house in order. So, no. Um, well, first of all, uh, stopping blowing up our alliances and undermining our allies would be a good first step. Uh, trying to work together, and that includes working on some of the challenges that we have with the global trade regimen, um, which is coming under challenge for good reasons, uh, but we need structures that can actually work uh, to make globalization work even better uh, in the ways that Jim has talked about. Um, and. I think moving back to doing things that can help protect and enhance democratic institutions in other countries. The sorts of things we've done uh, throughout at least a good portion of our modern history um, that we've fallen down on. In the United States, to me, the, the most heartening movement is the rise of forces in our civil society who now see a real threat to the fundamentals of our way of life and are stepping up to the plate. And that includes you. Uh, it includes uh, a lot of religious uh, communities around the country, uh, across the board, who are stepping up. It includes a lot of forces trying to make sure our democracy can work. Uh, it includes lawyers who uh, jumped in when we had the travel ban and who are stepping up with some of the immigration issues and who are suing and at least having some impact in the courts uh, in keeping some of the worst things from happening or from getting even worse. Uh, and that's helpful and it's hopeful in some ways. Uh, and putting pressure on those institutions and making sure that people can vote and that where there is a popular desire to change the way things have been going, to do something about it and make sure that it's done in a legitimate fashion. Um, I also am heartened by the fact that in, when the Democrats took the House of Representatives, their first bill, H.R. 1, is a broad democracy measure. We didn't get here just because our institutions and our structures have failed. Uh, making some changes isn't magically going to end uh, income inequality or some of the forces of globalization or the changing demographic nature of the country. Um, in ways that will make things all sweetness and light. But if we don't begin to change some of the structures, protect democracy by protecting voting, begin to combat what is a really pernicious influence of big money and dark money in our politics, and change things like the Electoral College and the nature of the House and Senate so that they are not a direct democracy, it is a republic, but they are more a reflection of the legitimate desires and will of the people. Even things like 
uh, something I've pushed for 25 years, term limits for uh, federal judges and justices, 18 years, single uh, terms, to both lower the temperature and keep one of the really bad things that can happen in this country, which is you get uh, courts stacked with young people for 30 or 40 years after voters have rejected your policies who have been conditioned and trained to protect those policies that voters no longer want, challenges to the legitimacy of the system. And I think the fact that we're starting to see a movement and that it's got a broader appeal in the country than we've had before, that's encouraging. We have to do something about the, uh, both the income inequality and also the tremendous disruption that comes with robotics, with in artificial intelligence, with technology that's going to upend people's lives over and over again. And that's not just in areas where there have been steel mills or, uh, or coal mines. Um, all the Uber drivers who have managed to find a foothold in life, um, either transitioning between jobs or being able to take their kids to school and pick them up without having a nine to five job, what happens when those jobs go away? What will replace them? We're gonna have to find better ways, and that means institutions that are functioning better than they have to train people in the right ways and give them the tools that they're gonna need to adapt. Well, I think we do need to start at home. I think we need to uh, worry about the strength of our own democracy and the attractiveness of it um, on a global scale. For more than 150 years, the United States has been the exemplar of democracy, a model which people sought to emulate. And we need to ensure that that continues to be the case in the future, which means uh, fixing uh, uh, some of the problems that we have at home. We've talked about income disparities. That's an area which clearly needs to be addressed. Um, uh, immigration, uh, we need uh, to have some kind of national consensus, it won't be perfect, about levels of le legal immigration and how to, how to sustain that at, at a level that the society as a whole can, uh, can accept and can be comfortable with. Um, uh, the, social media and the internet needs to be fixed. Um, somebody has to be responsible for the content. Now there are sort of three possibilities. Individuals can be held responsible, but that's very hard because most of them are anonymous. They can't be found, they can't be prosecuted. Um, the government could take responsibility, that's called censorship. Or the social media companies could be held responsible in the same way that a newspaper publisher is responsible for the material that it, that it publishes. Same way a, a television station is responsible for the material it publishes. So we do need to change the way we think about uh, responsibility in handling uh, social media. Um, so those are some of the things. Now, in terms of internationally, I think first of all, we have to be faithful to our own ideals uh, it doesn't mean that we uh, propagate democracy at the, at, the, at the point of a rifle. I think we've found that forceful uh, interventions to, to bring democracy are a mixed, uh, have a mixed record at best. Um, and, uh, uh, but, uh, but we do need to differentiate our relationships between countries that share our values and countries that don't. It doesn't mean we don't talk to countries that don't share our values. It doesn't mean we don't cooperate with them, but we don't have the same intimate and positive relationship, and we criticize them when uh, they vary from not only our norms, but internationally established norms, uh, which have been put in place over the last 75 years, uh, and which are fairly clear in terms of uh, civil and political rights, uh, human rights, and, uh, and we ought to stand up for those and criticize those who don't share them. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me address the, the international dimension. You know, when I speak to audiences about the U.S. role in supporting democracy, I think three things immediately pop into people's minds, and they make perfect sense why they do. First, you think... If you hear me and you think, uh-oh, here comes one of those democracy promoters. Um, the first is, does that mean invading countries and like, oh, that was just awful what happened in Afghanistan and Iraq and look at Libya, it's a mess. I don't want to do that. Secondly, 
who in the world are we? Look at our, the mess we have in our own country. Who are we to tell other countries what kind of political system they have? And then third, why should I care whether Ukraine is democratic or Myanmar makes its transition? Those are three powerful feelings, and they're real, and they're valid. But we also need some perspective on them. First, with respect to <coughs> invading other countries, 99.9% .9 of US efforts to try to support democracy that are real over the last 20 or 30 years have not been about invading other countries. Those are the very few exceptions. Instead, in other places, uh, we've done a lot of good things. Uh, we've supported judiciaries to try to be stronger. We've helped independent media thrive. We've helped independent investigative journalists uncover corruption in their countries. I could go on and on, but we tend to focus on those two or three really disturbing and costly and in some ways failing cases and say, I don't want to do that. But that's not what most of this is. Secondly, who are we to have a say in other countries? It's not actually good democracy promotion has never been and should never be about us coming and saying, you ought to be this way. We're so great, you're not. I could help you. Instead, it's saying, you're struggling. You want something better in your country. We're struggling too. This is tough. Our legislature's a mess. You're trying to make yours better. Let's talk. We have some experience. We have some resources. We could bring some people in from over this country that have done well, have them talk to you. We're not saying, we're certainly not going to bring our congressmen to talk to yours about how to make the Congress work. <laughs> but they have over here made some interesting progress. Let's bring them together. Let's make this a process of mutual learning. Let's acknowledge that we're struggling and maybe we could learn something from you. Uh, and so good democracy promotion is not about lecturing and somebody saying we have the answers, but it's about recognizing that people around the world are struggling to achieve something and we can be part of that process and it can be part of our own process. And then third, why should we care? First of all, because we're a big people. We're a big country. We have real power. Why shouldn't we care? It's, to me, is a better question. But it is in our interest. Actually, if Ukraine succeeds with this transition towards democracy, it'll more likely have positive economic and security relations with the West, less with Russia. If Myanmar manages to pull away from the bad practices of the last 50 years, it'll be less of a Chinese dominion. It'll commit fewer ethnic atrocities and so forth. They're real reasons we can care. They're not big, they're not earth shattering to US interests, but by the time you add them up, it's real. And so if we, we confront our fears and uncertainties about this topic and be honest about them, we can turn it around and say, no, there are reasons. There are reasons why it isn't always about military intervention. It isn't, doesn't mean that we're so great, but it means we can share and we should care. There are real interests that we have in other countries. Let, let me just before we ask you to join by uh, maybe uh, at this point joining us here to make any comments or question uh, you want to have, I'd just like to add one point. And I bel I'm concerned that we are uh, vastly overreaching. And so while the term humility sounds like something kind of a religious value, uh, I mean it in a technical sense. We keep telling people that, we, for instance, take the issue of inequality. It's a terrible, terrible issue. There's no question about that. And the concentration continues. In effect, there are many people believe it's going to get worse because more and more is going to depend on technologies and AI, and there's going to be there being going to be a small number of people who are going to have the skills, and a small number of people are going to invest in it, and more and more people are going to be left out. So uh, there, there can be no question that inequality is a major challenge. But to be honest about it, and it's important to be honest about it, we don't begin to know what to do about it. And so the notion that we'll, and I'm perfectly happy to entertain the notion, that we're going to tax people who make more than 10 million at 70% and we tax their estate and such. But countries who did that uh, barely made a dent in inequality. And so if you look at Scandinavia and such, uh, it's a very, very difficult issue. Uh, climate, of course, we can, is urgent that we do things about it. But we also need to acknowledge how challenging and, and difficult it is, and so on, so on. If you look at Germany and the immigration story, uh, it's, it was a wonderful, ennobling thing. I think many of us cheered endlessly when Germany threw the door open 
and took in more than a million uh, refugees. Uh, but we didn't take into account the thing, many of us didn't. What kind of social processes have to be put into place to help these people uh, accept the norms of a democratic society, help the, those who are unaccustomed to immigrants next door to live with them. Uh, the Germans uh, created some civic classes, uh, 60 hours. Well, I'm sorry, it doesn't quite uh, take somebody who comes from a very different culture with lifelong habits and 60 hours uh, 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 get them acclimated. To the, so if you look at what we see again and again, every place you turn, it's so easy to say we, we must do X, we must do Y, and pile up one on the other. I think we maybe need the kind of opposite rhetoric, kind of triage rhetoric. Let's ask what are our most burning issues, where we have most leverage, and put as many of our eggs in, in one basket, well, not, not one, but where we really can have results, because otherwise, uh, what's going to happen, the, the majority of people are going to get ever more disappointed and ever more distrustful of our elected governments if we keep promising to fix all those things and deliver so little. Uh, please, somebody has to start the discussion. Uh, thank you for a very interesting discussion. Um, if we look globally, if we, if we, I'm Dalton Conley uh, from Princeton University. Um, globally, um, we see that even countries that have zero immigration, like the Philippines, have had an authoritarian turn. So I want to build on what Ambassador Dobbins was saying about this being the best of at least existing worlds to, and, and uh, highlight some research on civil unrest in the United States in the 1960s. It was actually um, the fact that things were getting better um, uh, in the 1960s in both with respect to civil rights and with booming economy but that things did not improve, that, that dro dro drove expectations to rise faster than the reality. And perhaps that's what we're seeing in the world now because um, things are getting better as you suggested. Uh, so I wanted to um, throw that out there and say that if, if the right political structures are in place and, and, you know, and Orban doesn't got the judiciary in Hungary and if we survive, then maybe this will be a, a period that will pass like if you, all you have to do is turn on Ken Burns' uh, um, Vietnam series to see if you think it's bad now how much we were coming apart at the seams 50 years ago, and this is the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam draft lottery this year. So I remember question, it only too well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my question is actually for you, Norman, which is um, the country that I'm most worried about is – I'm not as worried about the, the uh, parliamentary democracies, which – are much more responsive to change of sentiment in the populace. I'm much more worried about our political structures, and you've talked about a couple. As we, I think that Paul Pearson and um, others, Packer. yeah, Jacob Packer, I was going as pointed out that that's not just 30 percent of the country controls um, the Senate. It, with a filibuster currently, 11 percent of the country can stop a bill um, uh, in the Senate. So I, I'm very worried about the the, the House increased every year in size with the census until 1920, and we haven't increased it since then. Um, but given the entrenched divisions, and, and why would Montana want to give um, D.C. statehood, or why would Montana want to give my home state of New York four senators or six senators, I mean, and, and forget about the Electoral College, when you have these kind of path-dependent political yeah. um, uh, uh, rivalries, how, how are we going to have a constitutional convention and change the whole system? We're the least democratic um, because we kind of were born with the compromise about slavery. We were born in a very agrarian period. If you look at more recent democracies, they're, you know, they improved on the model in a sense. If you look at Australia or Canada or most of Western Europe. I'm, so I'm much more, much, structurally much more worried about the United States and how do we fix the basic um, structural problems that we have in our, in our republic? Uh, that's a really good question with a lot of different components to it. Um, let me say first that I do think that as things get better and expectations rise and they aren't met, it creates a challenge. I also think that as things get more uncertain, people look for certainty. 
and leaders who come in and tell them, I'm going to give you something, that's an appeal. And we see that with millennials who entertain the idea that maybe we, you know, we shouldn't have a democracy. It's too messy. Uh, in terms of the structures, it, it, there's an interaction between the structures and the culture. So the filibuster, uh, you could make a case. The last time it was changed before more recently, 1975, for 40 years it worked fairly well and in fact had the impact we would want it to have, which is that it was used very rarely, but it was there and provided incentives for leaders to find a supermajority. And one of my mentors, and uh, who I miss every day, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who said many, many wise things, but one was, in this country we don't do significant social change without broad leadership consensus and we had incentives to build that. The tribalism that Newt Gingrich uh, helped mightily to precipitate took that away, and it became used as a weapon of mass obstruction. Uh, changing it is now probably something we have to really think about, but there are gonna be consequences to that too, as with a lot of these structural changes. We need to work on the culture as well. I will say more broadly, if I could do one thing it would be to have a mandatory national service uh, a year or two years. You do national service, doesn't have to be military service obviously, it can be in any area where you build this sense that you're a part of a larger society and entity. You interact with people of all different kinds of uh, education, culture, ethnicity and the like and in return you give some student loan forgiveness or some other things that bind people to a society but the structural changes have to come along with that. I am all in favor at this point, something I wouldn't have been in favor of before, of increasing the size of the house, which only takes a law, change in the law. Increase it by 100, and the whole electoral college calculus changes, but you're also gonna get a more broadly representative uh, body. Uh, the Senate's a much more difficult uh, task. Um, and there, here we hit a challenge. If Democrats win the House, the Senate, the presidency, one temptation is going to be to add Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia as states. Um, all the other changes that we've talked about, the campaign finance system uh, and the like, you're going to have to have 60 votes in the Senate, and there you probably can only do it by fracturing norms further by altering the filibuster rule with implications down the road. But we may have to do that, and that's uh, the same with changes in the courts. Uh, and another thing I would do is, uh, again, it can be done by law. There's a 1967 law that requires single-member districts in Congress. I'm reading a really interesting book now, a, a manuscript, that says that every Western democracy that has a single-member district first past the post system, whoever gets the most votes wins, has built in a distortion between the rural and urban areas that's a growing dysfunction. And if we had uh, multi-member districts and preference voting, um, it would help. I would also like to see uh, ranked choice voting for presidential elections because I don't want Jill Stein or a Jill Stein equivalent or a, a Howard Schultz or anybody else to distort the outcome of elections. If you can have a second choice and then have those votes aggregated uh, to the first uh, choice, uh, that would be very helpful. So we can do some things structurally, but unless we begin to work on the culture and move away from the kind of sectarianism that's, in, that's uh, growing in the country and begin to do more to work across the lines to uh, get a different understanding of race in the society, because uh, I think we, that's been poisoned more than we've ha seen it since the great advances of the 60s and 70s. Black Lives Matter is something that everybody ought to see and take seriously. There is a difference. When I sent my kids out and they were 16 and they drove, I was scared to death they'd get into an accident. I didn't have to worry every single time that someone would get shot for reasons that had nothing to do with anything other than the color of their skin. And we all need to recognize those things and we need to work on that. And that to me is just as important as changing the structures. And Noam said that the first most important thing he wanted to do is national service. So I'm going to add one line here. 
one of the concerns some of the critics have that national service is actually very expensive because you have to pay uh, people uh, some kind of a salary and, or you know, need, need to give them health uh, insurance and so on and so on. But uh, during our last meeting here in January, Isabel Sawhill from Brookings came up with what I consider a very ingenious solution. And her idea is the national service people will be living in people's homes. So people volunteer like we sometimes do for foreign students. We will uh, host national service people. So it's a wonderful little touch. Uh, you guys want to join here or you want to wait for the next round? Please. Hi. Thank you all so much for your presentations. It's tempting to ask you lots of questions. I'm just going to ask one really narrow one. Uh, I'm interested in your thoughts about the Electoral College. Is there anything we should be rethinking there uh, in support of, or is it okay as it is? Thanks. I'd actually like to defer to Norm, but let me add one comparative perspective because I work mostly on democracy out there and other parts of the world. Put it simply, no other country has this system. Uh, you know, Tom is right in so many ways. No other country has partisan officials who adjudicate elections. Uh, we're the only country that does that as well. Um, the Electoral College is broken, uh, I believe. When, the, uh, when it was set in place, it was obviously a deal that had to be worked out to get uh, uh, states together. Um, the ratio of uh, population between the smallest and the largest states was 12 to 1 when they started to work on this, then 16 to 1, now it's 70 to 1. And there's a real tilt towards smaller states and towards more homogeneous areas. In the 44 elections from 1824, when the popular vote really was first counted significantly, through 1996, arguably one election where it was clear the winner of the popular vote lost the presidency. One out of 44, since then two out of five, and that's going to continue. So can it, can it be done short of a constitutional convention? Actually, uh, there's a movement called the National Popular Vote Compact. Uh, we now have 175 electoral votes where states have passed laws saying that once it gets past the 270 majority, then they will direct their electors to vote for the winner of the popular vote. That's probably not going to happen in the foreseeable future. And that's where I'll come back to what I said before. If you enlarge the House by 100, most of those additional House members, which will count as electoral votes, are going to go to the larger states. You know, we now have Wyoming with a population 170th of California that still gets one House member and gets an electoral vote as a consequence. If you add 100, probably Wyoming isn't going to get a second one, but California will get five or six more, and Florida will get more, and, uh, and uh, Massachusetts will get more, and other states will, and it will correct some of that imbalance and create a little more uh, uh, of a representative nature. Hello. Good evening. I really appreciate being here, and I appreciate you coming here. <laughs> I as, would like to especially thank Mr. Ornstein because a lot of what he said I related to. I have to tell you that I'm a legal immigrant and I am a black immigrant and I do feel that very uncomfortable in this country at this time. And I would like to tell you that I think that although you say, come to the country, you welcome all of us, you don't treat us like we are welcome. Also, I would also like to say that I am wondering what you are taught in the schools because the only people who are not immigrants or descendants of immigrants are the native people and the slaves who were brought here. So I would like you to internalize the fact that you're either an immigrant or descended from immigrants. And I think that when you know that and you know that the majority of you came here poor and accumulated your wealth here, just like 
the other immigrants who are coming now are trying to do, that maybe you will look at us, treat us as equals, and we could move on as a country together. Also, I, I have no criticism against the country. I think the founding fathers were brilliant men. They were not perfect men, but they were brilliant men. Of course, they didn't have a woman to make things better. <laughs> but I do feel that capitalism, although it is something we all want because we feel that we are more creative and so on with capitalism, it has to be tempered. And maybe it was tempered more when unions were not eliminated and there were some restrictions put in place. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for standing up and saying what you have to say. Hi, thank you very much for coming here and speaking with us. Um, I heard all of you speak about how income inequality is having a huge effect on democracies across the world. And I, meant, I heard you mention as well that you're not quite sure how to fix it, but you did all mention the middle class. Um, Thomas Piketty in his book, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, I think it's called, or the 20th century, anyway, uh, mentioned that the last big change in the distribution of wealth in the United States was around World War II when um, the, the wealthy were forced to provide more. Um, I'm wondering what you think are the best, first off, how important you think um, fixing the income inequality problem in the United States is to our democracy? And second, what are the best ways you've heard that, uh, theories that you've heard to do that? Thank you. I could start with an answer. I mean, I think <clears throat> I disagree with you slightly, Amitai, when you were calling for humility. We're all in favor of that. But I don't think it's a mystery how countries reduce inequality. It doesn't mean it's not easy, though. So there's two different things. One is do we know what one would do to reduce inequality, and the other is can we get there? Because to reduce it isn't, and some countries have done better in that regard than the United States. Wealthy countries have done better. I mean, one of the most basic ways which we're really going down the wrong path is, is investment in secondary and tertiary education, particularly junior colleges, state colleges, the, the base of the working class and middle class education that's accessible to many people. It's no surprise that inequality has been increasing in the last 20 years when many states are starving state education systems, starving technical institutions, starving junior colleges, and so forth. And so it's, it's not a direct fix that occurs tomorrow, but it's a basic social policy that we know gets there over time <clears throat> and helps the country move away from high levels of inequality. It is also the case that there are uh, ways to reduce what Norm was talking about, that one-tenth of one percent. There are basic things that you can do, uh, like the carry forward and other things that, that can be taken if politicians are willing to uh, to do that. Or the estate tax, you know, it's only on people with estates of more, was it $10 million these days, but the, the Republican Party wants to eliminate even that. If you, you know, keep the estate tax or maybe increase it slightly in other ways, that also reduces. So there are ways you can both very broadly within the society reduce some of the sources of inequality, and there are ways you can go after the problem of the fact that since the financial crisis in 2008 and nine. Over 90% of the economic recovery has been concentrated in 1% of the population. That's wrong. That's not a result of some natural economic laws. That's a result of certain basic economic policies that choices have been made to do that. Different choices could be made. Let, let me add to that. It's not just about income inequality. This is wealth inequality. And I would focus on a couple of things. Uh, one is... Uh, we have a terrible problem here, and you saw it with the shutdown. People with government jobs, and many of them paying what on the surface are reasonable wages, going 35 days without a paycheck left them in the lurch. 40, over 40% 40 of Americans say that they could not come up with $400 in cash for an emergency. At the height of the uh, downturn after 2008, it was 60%. 
Imagine that. You blow a rod on the car or you hit a pothole and two tires go out. You have a health emergency. Uh, we have a storm like the ones that we've had and a tree branch goes through your roof and you need to have the uh, deductible to pay the insurance company to fix it and you can't come up with $400. We can do things about that. One of the things that was proposed a couple of decades ago by Bob Kerry, who was then a senator from Nebraska, was called Kids Save. And it's not a terribly expensive program. Every child born in America gets $1,000 at birth put into an account, put away for the future. And then $1,000 a year for the first five years. And with accumulated interest, you're going to have a nest egg. And you don't want them to be able to take it out for any particular purpose, but you're going to have something that actually gives you a stake in the society. And there are other ways in which we can encourage savings. The other thing we need to do is not just focus on the things that we really want to do, that Tom talked about at the very top, but we need to raise people up to provide that safety net. It, it should be a national goal that every American has health insurance that is affordable and that covers the things that uh, everybody needs to have covered. And how we get there, we can have a big debate about, but that has to be a goal. There has to be a wage level where if you do what's a part of the social contract and you go to work every day, uh, that you're going to be able to have a roof over your heads. And there are programs that can provide at least better affordable housing and that you can uh, send your kids to college and you're going to have food on the table. There are ways in which we can alter policies. And th those don't just have to be by, say, raising a minimum wage. You can work things out where a portion of it is a tax credit for companies that adds to the wage base so that it's not just uh, all uh, paid in a fashion that might discourage work. There are, there are innovative proposals that can be done. We can begin to move in a fashion where people at least feel there's a sense of fairness and not just that they're working harder and harder, working two jobs, both spouses working two jobs, without paid family leave, without the ability to have child care, while the people at the very top are worried about whether they're going to get a second or third Gulfstream 5 uh, so that they have matching ones for all the family members. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's much difficulty conceptually coming up with measures that would uh, correct uh, uh, or ameliorate uh, 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 income disparity or even wealth disparity. Some combination of a stronger safety net and progressive tax policies would do this. The trick is how to, how to do this First, there's two, there's two obstacles. One is getting a political consensus in support of it. Um, and uh, the second is doing it in a manner that doesn't stifle growth. Um, and of course, one of the arguments against it that the 0.1% the will use is that it'll stifle growth, which is historically proved wrong, that you can have a healthy, strong, growing economies that that nevertheless, uh, avo you can't avoid some income disparity, but you can avoid the extremes that we've had. And we've had periods in our own history where that's the case. So those are the two questions, is how to do, how to do it politically and how to do it in a manner that doesn't stifle growth. Well, there's been a lot of agreement and consensus, it seems, with today's panel. And compared to prior panels, it's kind of surprising. So I guess I'll be a little contrarian and suggest or throw, toss out the idea that maybe democracies are idiosyncratic things that are different, so different depending on the traditions and customs where they evolve or emerge, that really it's really hard to generalize across them. I think people like Dahl even tried to avoid the term, come up with something else that was more empirically useful. Uh, if democracies are hard to generalize about. And if it's hard to quantify or even generalize about political development, maybe we shouldn't be as pessimistic about the state of democracy today. Maybe democracies can only be looked at across maybe generations or longer cycles of time than the new cycle, in which case maybe things wouldn't look quite as bad. But, I mean, it's not to say we shouldn't try to establish conditions to support democracy, especially where it is struggling and failing. But I'm not sure that we're not overreacting to the Bolsonaros and 
the other and the Trumps and the other crazy things that have us so upset these days. So I just want to toss that out as people thought about it. Can we really socially engineer democracy, try to help another country over it based on experience with democracy in our different countries? Thank you. No, could I? I guess thank you for that comment. I mean, I, <clears throat> I do a lot of speaking to audiences in other countries about democracy. And usually when I, whatever I say, the first question or two is, we want to have our own kind of democracy. We don't necessarily want to have your kind of democracy. And I'm all for that. You know, I don't, it's not up to me to know how South African legislative bodies should best be constituted and whether they should have village councils or regional councils or that or whether or not you know they want to structure their press in a way so that they have a big public broadcasting corporation and this and that. Of course, every democracy makes myriad choices that are very different from each other. But here's where I feel uncomfortable. When I'm in my office and I get a visit from a Chinese official and I, I get them and they come and they say, oh, you're a specialist in democracy. We want to tell you about Chinese democracy and how well it's doing. I said, well, okay, tell me about Chinese democracy. And I say, it, it, it seems like the case in China that, you know, if I'm a citizen and I don't like this government, A, if I say that out loud, somebody's going to come and put me in jail. And secondly, I have no mechanism for, for changing the government, which I would have the ability in some small way to do that. And what it leads me to is the feeling that we have to be very tolerant of diversity of democracies, but we can't give up certain basic fundamental principles, which is that government for the people, by the people, and of the people. The people get to choose the government. Now, there need to be protections of rights so that it isn't just raw majoritarian rule. And these people say, we don't like people who look like this or act like this, and we can suppress them in the name of democracy. So people have to have basic civil and political rights, as well as the chance to choose the government. But I'm uncomfortable going too far to say that we, we have no idea really what democracy is. I think we have the idea that democracies are highly varied, a lot to learn from each other, but I don't want to give up on some fundamentals. Yeah, I mean, democracy is, has taken root in some remarkably stony soil. Uh, India is a good case. I mean, it clearly demonstrates that you don't need a large middle class to, to have a, a functioning and deeply rooted democracy. Um, you do need a sense of traditions and, and, and Britain for all the faults of colonialism, uh, succeeded in, uh, in in establishing some of those traditions in India. Um, uh, I, I think um, I go back to what I suggested. We need to continue to make America the envy of the world, which doesn't mean they have to adopt our system um, or that we're forcing them to adopt their system, but it means they do have an example of a functioning democracy that is successful economically, is successful socially, uh, and continue to uh, create uh, an aspiration that others can, um, can, uh, can aspire to. I would just add one thing. I, I give a hat tip to Ronald Reagan, who created some institutions with both parties that I think have done extraordinary things. I was a part of an observer delegation of the National Democratic Institute and the International Republican Institute at the first election in Romania after Ceausescu fell. And I've been to other countries through the auspices of those institutions. They are trying to protect the legitimacy of elections and fight against some corruption. And we also see institutions like the National Endowment for Democracy who are functioning to try and build civic institutions and civil societies in countries they're going to build their own forms of government, but it's protecting the fundamentals that uh, my colleagues have talked about. And those are really important objectives, and we're in danger of losing some of them now because the funding is going away, or this sense of nationalism. Uh, that's patriotic to me, and patriotism trumps nationalism. Um, I, you may not have seen contrarianism as much as I'm going to bring it up, but can you even call us a democracy when half the country is not even in our constitution? And you should see a groundswell of support for that that we're just not seeing. And let me just say, is the only person 
in this panel, who and I love the panelists. Let me do, I, it, that would provide racial or gender diversity not here. Why is that? <laughs> that I don't want to get distracted. I want to get distracted. <laughs> right. Well, well. At the same time, I mean, you were kind of. I thought you were going on this, but we it, it, inclusion is important. And do I have to? Stop paying taxes because I'm not in the Constitution. Is it going to take, you know, a groundswell of of contrarianism that that was the the impetus for getting suffrage a hundred years ago? Thank you for considering democracy. Uh, your point is well taken, and we really uh, Thank you so much. <laughs> part, part, part of our diversity, unfortunately, seems to be stuck in Atlanta. But uh, that doesn't uh, answer your question fairly. We need to do better, and if you look at the totality of our dialogue, you see they're becoming fairly close to a more inclusive uh, panel, but your point is well taken. Um, I just have a quick point to make. And all of these suggestions are just wonderful. This panel has been great. Um, but how do we deal with this when, when we have a major political party that is really trying to stop democracy, trying to, you know, tear it all down? And I don't know if any of you have talked to a Republican lately, but it is impossible to talk to them. They just are, like, closed-minded. So I just thought I'd bring that up. That's true. Uh, let's take another question. Okay. Um, I think it was this past week there was an article about a hedge fund leader, and it had various um, aspects to it or different um, subcultures or subsidiaries. And they were buying up newspapers, gutting them, um, selling the property. You know, where if we need our newspapers to be stronger and our news organizations to be stronger. They seem to be consolidating, and especially in rural areas, they're getting less news, and it's regurgitated news. You know, how can we stop that, or how can we open up our news media so we're getting the real message? So we have two questions. Two questions. Uh, what to do about the Republican Party, <laughs> and uh, second, uh, how to prevent the, uh, the newspapers from being more, ever more monopolized. So on, on the Republican Party, uh, the good news, I would say, is that people who are not in office, conservatives, Republicans, many of them are stepping up to the plate and are saying, this is not the party that I expected to be a part of or want to be a part of. And whether it's Bill Kristol or Jennifer Rubin or Max Boot um, or Evan McMullen uh, or George Will, there's a whole lot of them who are taking a, a very a tough stand. Not so much people in office, and that's a real problem. And m my answer is the solution for the country, because we need two parties that are problem-solving parties, is they're going to have to lose three elections in a row. If you lose one election, it's, oh, we just blew it. It was really bad time. You lose two, and it's, Duh, how could we have chosen that idiot as a candidate? By the third time, you realize it's something deeper. And that's when traction for people, it's going to be a conservative party. It's not going to be an Eisenhower party uh, or uh, a Nixon party. Um, but you're going to get traction for people who return to trying to broaden the base of support from a narrow uh, one that's a very destructive one and that focuses more on solving problems. Um, the uh, second question about newspapers is an enormous challenge. And what we are seeing is uh, there are a couple of really pernicious outfits that are destroying newspapers and basically picking them clean uh, to make money. Um, the other side of that is we have uh, terrific owners of the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, and now the Los Angeles Times, who uh, have enough resources that they are willing to uh, step up for the system and actually even providing some ideas that can make them uh, into functioning money-making enterprises. How long they'll be money-making when Donald Trump goes, it may be a different challenge for the Washington Post. But in the media age, in the, in the internet age, 
uh, it's going to be almost impossible for regular news organizations in local areas to be able to make it. Um, now, a lot of people say that it was uh, Craig Newmark who did this when he founded Craigslist because newspapers used to make all their money from classified ads. There is a lot more research that shows that the problem goes before that. In that time, newspapers were cash cows. They were making 30, 40 percent profit margins. And you, they leveraged themselves to the hilt, overbought, and created a lot of their own problems. Uh, it was, uh, and then they got destroyed with the new era. But uh, we're going to have to find different ways of getting news to local areas. And we have some innovations there. Uh, the Knight Foundation in Miami is looking at different ways. ProPublica is a fantastic organization. We're going to have to have local communities creating their own entities to watch over government officials. Or that's another big challenge that we're going to have because it's the tribal media that will take over. Well, the answer to the first question is vote. <laughs> um, the answer to the second question is... Uh, early and often. The answer to the second question is that Advertising revenue has shifted from newspaper from from media content providers to uh, to the social media who don't create content they just pass it along and so Facebook and Twitter and others are making billions uh, and newspapers are uh, dependent on a few members of the 0.1 percent who are socially minded, which is not, a, uh, not an entirely dependable long-term solution to the problem. Um, I think there are ways of skewing um, regulatory uh, uh, arrangements that would, that would force social media to pay more for the content they're using. In other words, if you, if you read, um, you know, if you get your, your information from social media, it's mostly being generated by the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other people who actually have journalists who are going out and doing investigative work and writing stories. And then it's, then it's being used by social media to generate their own profits. And so I think some way, including allowing uh, newspapers to bargain collectively with social media for the use of their material, um, uh, which is now forbidden by antitrust uh, uh, provisions, uh, would be a way of shifting some of those resources back to the content, provi content uh, providers um, rather than just the social media. If social media actually hire journalists, if Facebook wants to create its own news organization, that might not be a bad thing um, because they would then be held responsible for the contents of what they were providing and they might actually be providing something. But the point is to shift the resources from uh, content transmitters back to the content providers. Uh, we almost closing here. Uh, let me just uh, go back to one point, and that is, I am concerned that overpromising and not delivering will add to the crisis we face. During the last election, if there was one thing both sides agreed on, is that there was really an obscenity and the fact that people who work for hedge funds uh, get taxed at a much more favorable rate than the rest of us. Uh, Trump made a major issue out of it, the Democrats, and what today? Today, nothing happened. They, they still have the same obscene uh, privilege. Uh, recently, we learned that uh, a family made billions out of uh, pushing doctors to uh, uh, use painkillers and pushed them on their patients so they knew they were addictive. When they get, got a fine, they told New Yorker last week, the fine was so small that they considered it part of the cost of doing business. So I think if we cannot get our handle even on the most outrageous things, uh, we should be careful not to promise people the moon and the sun and the stars and, on, and instead focus first on first uh, uh, priorities. Now, uh, next month, uh, in April, when we reconvene here, we're going to be talking about genetic engineering on, uh, on making babies on demand, uh, which attributes the parents prefer, maybe the government prefers, 
and I, I hope many of you will be able to join us for tonight. Uh, thank you for uh, excellent discussion, excellent question. Please help me thank the panel for tonight. Thank you.